Amen. So last week, at the end of our service, we did a little activity together. So for those that were here uh, with us on Pentecost, it was a great Sunday. I was just uh, lamenting that, you know, we decorated our sanctuary with these red banners that looked really cool, and then Pentecost is over, and we have to take it all down. It's kind of annoying. But we have cool green ones now for ordinary times. So, uh, so yeah, we uh, celebrated Pentecost last week, and one of the things that we did during our service is each of us had a little piece of paper, and we wrote down our hopes and dreams of how we might partner with the Holy Spirit and the Spirit's work um, in our church and community in the next year. So how are we going to join up with the Spirit to do meaningful work in our community in this next year? And so you all uh, wrote down things, and you came and you put them on the cross, and it, it kind of made an image of the cross being consumed in flames, uh, this was uh, Felice's idea, and I thought it was just great, and it was a beautiful representation of the Holy Spirit and what the Spirit might be able to do um, in us and in our community. I went through and I, I read through them, and I was just really encouraged by, by the things that you all wrote down. I want to mention some recurring themes that I noticed. I would say the most predominant theme that, that I saw was that many of you we're really just hoping and dreaming that we could work with others to make a positive impact on gun violence in our community. And I'm not surprised that's on your all's hearts. It's on my heart as well. It's one of those things that is just breaking my heart. I know yesterday there were many marches all across the nation and, and perhaps even across the world uh, standing up to say, hey, we've got to do something about this. And, and so I'm excited and looking forward to dreaming together about what we might be able to do as a congregation. Some other things that you all shared, that, that we would become a no, more diverse congregation um, with genuine love and connection across divides. I think that, that if you are like me, I, I've just really been lamenting kind of the way that society just is so fractured and fragmented and everyone is just kind of in their own camps and we don't talk to one another, we're not working across divides very well. And churches are no different. They're splitting over all sorts of issues um, right now. And, and Embrace, I know many of you all are hoping we can do something different at our church. And I really hope that for that as well. Another, some other things you all shared, that we would have closer and more vulnerable community within our church. That we would truly know one another and be able to walk with one another and know what's going on in our lives. That our church would become even more inclusive and more welcoming of everyone. That embrace would be more visible out in our broader Lexington community. I was pleasantly surprised. Many of you all put this down, that you really see what we do here is really important. And I think for many of you all, you're hoping we can get out in the community more and be more visible, allowing kind of our unique witness and our unique identity uh, to make an impact. And, and as I read through your all's hopes and dreams for the Spirit's work, in our church and community, I have to say I was encouraged by what you all shared. And I wasn't, I was encouraged by, I thought they were great, hopes and dreams, but that's not really the deeper reason why I was encouraged. The main reason I was encouraged is because your hopes and dreams for the Spirit's work sounded a lot like Jesus. Um, it looked a lot like Jesus. As I read through all of them, I'm like, ah, oh, Jesus would be excited about this and would do this kind of stuff. And this is good news. Because if it didn't sound like Jesus, then I don't think the Spirit would have anything to do with those hopes and dreams, just to be honest. Because the Holy Spirit is all about Jesus. The Holy Spirit is all about Jesus. I want to read our text for this morning. It's John chapter 16, verses 12 through 15. And we're going back again to this farewell discourse, these last kind of moments Jesus shared with his disciples. Over the last few weeks, we've kind of gone in and out of some of these verses in the farewell discourse. And here's what Jesus says. He says, I have much more to say to you, more than you can now bear. He'd already said a lot before that, so he's got more, he said, but you cannot bear it now. But when he, the Spirit of truth, comes, he will guide you into all the truth. He will not speak on his own, but he will speak only what he hears, and he will tell you what is yet to come. He will glorify me, because it is from me that he will receive what he will make known to you. All that belongs to the Father is mine. 
That is why I said the Spirit will receive from me what he will be, what he will make known to you. Now there's a lot going on in just these few verses, and we're not going to get into all of it. But what I want you to focus in on this morning is that the Holy Spirit is all about Jesus. These words come from the farewell discourse, as I said, these final words that Jesus shared with his disciples before he was arrested and taken off to his unjust trial and then his execution on the cross. And his disciples, you need to understand, the, during these, these chapters of John, these disciples were very worried, they were very anxious, they were very afraid, things had gotten very dangerous for them and for their community, Jesus was talking about leaving them, he was talking about hard things to come, and they were getting very anxious and afraid. And Jesus told them that he was going to leave them, but he promised them that he wouldn't leave them alone. He said he would send them the Spirit, the Advocate, or the Paraclete in Greek. In these verses, we learn that the Spirit is all about Jesus. In verse 14, Jesus says that the Spirit will glorify him. The Spirit will glorify Jesus. Now, when we, I think of glorify, I think of like giving praise and honor, and that's part of what that means. But in the Gospel of John, to glorify means to make visible, all right? To glorify means to make visible. And so part of the Spirit's job is to make Jesus visible. So even though Jesus is going to leave his disciples, he assures them that they will still be able to see him to experience Him, to learn from Him through the Holy Spirit. The Spirit is glorifying Jesus, making Jesus visible, allowing us to see the work of Jesus around us. The Spirit is always pointing to Jesus. The Spirit is all about Jesus. You know, as Christians, uh, we sing songs about this. It's all about you, Jesus. We often say that we are all about Jesus. But I think the reality is that more often than not, maybe we are all about ourselves. <laughs> Growing up, uh, one of my favorite movies was the Disney film Aladdin. Y'all know this movie? I, I love Aladdin. Uh, the remake of it with real actors was kind of strange. I didn't like that too much. Um, but I imagine many of you all know the basic premise of Aladdin, but let me give you just a really short synopsis. Aladdin and his pet monkey, Abu, find a lamp in the hidden cave of wonders. And this lamp is unlike any other, for Aladdin rubs the lamp and discovers a genie who can give him three wishes. Now, I loved this movie as a child, I think because I loved the idea or the possibility of finding some kind of genie who could grant me wishes, right? That's like all of our dreams, right? We get three wishes. I would always think, what would be my three wishes that I would give? And try to scam the system, you know, to get more wishes, you know. But there are rules about this. You can't do that. Um, but I love the idea that a genie could give me all that I ever wanted and desired. And apparently a lot of other people are really excited about this idea because Aladdin was wildly popular and successful, made lots of money, in this plot line of finding a genie who grants wishes has been used many times over. The idea of finding a genie hidden in a lamp that exists to give you all your heart's desires fits really nicely in America, doesn't it? <laughs> in our culture that is so self-obsessed, that is so all about me, you can have anything you want. You can be anything you want. You can achieve all your dreams and do anything you want. It's all about you. Now, I think some of this idea of individualism has been helpful, but I think much of it has been very hurtful to humanity and to the church. Um, our churches have been infiltrated by this American ideal of individualism, personal success, personal prosperity. You know, when I was in college, this is kind of an extreme example, but, but, but this idea is all over the place. When I was in college, my roommate and I uh, we're up late watching TV one night. This is what you did before smartphones, I think. You just stayed up and watched TV. And late at night, there's not really anything on. And so we were watching an infomercial, uh, which was really exciting. This televangelist came on, and he was trying to get folks to support his ministry. And one way to get the his kind of foot in the door was to try to get you to sign up for his mailing list. 
And so if you did what he said, if you sign up for my mailing list, you call the number on the screen, I'm going to send you a green prosperity handkerchief in the mail. And so it's a, a handkerchief. It's supposed to give you prosperity. And so according to the man on television, he's going to pray over these handkerchiefs before he sends them to you. And, and then he's going to send it. And if you pray with it in your hand, then you can have prosperity. You can have healing. You can have miracles in your life. All sorts of wonderful things. On his website, he has a frequently asked question kind of page. And one of the frequently asked questions, apparently, uh, he probably made this up, but it is, why is the, the prayer handkerchief green? Well, he says that green represents renewal and prosperity. In the spring, plants come to life and sprout green leaves. In the United States, green is the color of money and prosperity. Now, if only the poor and suffering all over the world could get their hands on one of these green prayer handkerchiefs, right? Right? then green U.S. dollars would start raining down on them and their, all their problems would melt away, right? <laughs> we know that sounds kind of absurd. This dude just wants to make money, increase his fortune and fame, and therefore he has misinterpreted and used Scripture to support this agenda that he has. You know, I remember a few years ago, this was really, this has happened time and time again by, by everyone on every side of the political aisle, but I remember a few years ago, Jeff Sessions, he was the attorney general at the time. He wanted to keep immigrants out of our nation, and so he actually used the Bible to support what he was wanting to do. And he misinterpreted and used Scripture to support hurtful and harsh treatment of immigrants. Slaveholders, we know this story. I talked about it last week. Have continued to want to build their fortunes on free labor. And so they misinterpreted and used Scripture to support that agenda. Church leaders want to have churches that are full of people. So often they water down the message so people feel comfortable in their seats, misinterpret and use scripture to support that agenda of having big old churches full of people. Pastors are often consumed by power and lust and greed. And so they use lots of God talk and spirit talk to manipulate people, manipulate their parishioners in oppressive and abusive ways. And we've seen this play out in just tragic in awful ways, time and time and time again. And many of you all in this room may be victims yourself of harsh treatment or manipulative kind of talk coming from people who claim to be uh, speaking on behalf of God. People want to make a lot of money and they don't want to share their money. <laughs> and so they ignore and explain away the dozens and dozens and dozens of words straight from Jesus' mouth about money and about wealth. Misinterpret, use scripture to support their own agendas. You know, often sometimes people don't want to work on their personal problems, but they claim to be prophetic and they scream at everybody and they misinterpret and use scripture to support their agenda and what they want. And, and I'm guilty of this in my own life, of doing all sorts of things to, to use God talk to kind of push forward at personal agendas that I have in my own life. You know, uh, we have a knack for wanting God to bless our agendas <laughs> instead of trying to get on board with God's agenda. We make plans, but God already has a plan, and it's a very beautiful plan. It's a plan that we would do well to get on board with. Um, in, in Drake's uh, music video for his song, God's Plan, uh, he, he films himself kind of giving money and cars and scholarships away to people. And, and he, so he's giving all this stuff away, all his fame, and he's just trying to bless people. And in a sense, I think what he might be communicating in this video is that his plan of building fame and fortune for himself is maybe not God's plan. Maybe God's plan is more about sharing and giving that and blessing other people. Perhaps at that moment, maybe he was beginning to see some glimpses that maybe there was more to life than just building up yourself. God's plan is better than that. In the fourth century, a long time ago, uh, many, many, many years ago, Constantine thought Jesus was going to have his back and help him build his empire. And so he made Christianity the official religion of the Roman Empire. He put crosses on swords and shields and slaughtered people in the name of Jesus. Today, our political leaders are no different. Republicans and Democrats and everyone else use lots and lots of God talk and Bible talk to justify drone strikes, abusive policies, and unhinged pursuit of wealth and power. Using Scripture, God talk, church, 
to justify actions that in fact look nothing like Jesus. There's a disconnect there, right? The Holy Spirit has a mission in this world, and it's actually, I think, very simple. The Spirit's very mission-focused. The Spirit is always pointing people to Jesus. So the Spirit, part of what the Spirit's doing in this world is the Spirit exists to empower Christians to continue the work of Jesus in this world. It's very simple. But if we can get that in our minds, know that's what the Spirit is about, to continue the ministry of Jesus, then it'll be a lot easier for us to discern where the Spirit's moving and where the Spirit isn't moving around us. And we can choose to go our own path, or we can choose to join the Spirit in the Spirit's mission, or we can work against the Spirit and pursue our own agenda and mission in the world. You know, we tend to think of the Holy Spirit like electricity, that we can just plug into the wall, you know, plug our plug right into the wall and just use the electricity for whatever we see fit, because that's how it works. So these amps, we plug them in, we turn them on, and they make sound. But the Spirit is not like that. The Spirit is not there to be manipulated or to be used for selfish gain. The Spirit has a mission already. And we can join the Spirit in the Spirit's mission. The Holy Spirit is not a power to be used, but a power that uses us. And there is a distinction there. That often much talk of the Spirit is just, oh, the Spirit's going to bless me in whatever I want to do. But the Spirit already has a mission, and the Spirit is working, and we can join up and allow that power to use us in ways that God intends. The Holy Spirit has a mission. It's about God's plan, not our plan. And God's plan is rooted in the ministry and work of Jesus Christ. If you want to know what God's plan is, it's rooted in the ministry and work of Jesus Christ. And so the first place to start, if you want to know what God's all about, read Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. All right, The four Gospels start there, Read about what Jesus taught, read about what he did, look at the way he lived his life. The Spirit's primary purpose is to continue what Jesus started through us, through his hands and feet, as the Bible talks about, right, in our world today. It's not as complicated as we make it out to be sometimes. That is what the Holy Spirit is all about. That's why uh, Reverend Barber, I, I love this man, he is leading a new poor people's campaign and they have a huge kind of march in in D.C. on Saturday coming up soon, and I really wish I could go. Diane, are you going this year? I can't go, Uh, but I wish I was going to be there. Yeah, but he's leading this poor people's campaign to really bring together all sorts of people across our nation to really try to to work for a society here in America that is that is more peaceable, where everybody is taken care of, where everybody is included, where everybody has enough. And he's doing it Because the poor were an integral part of Jesus' ministry. Jesus led a poor people's campaign. And so now when folks are working with the poor, it's Holy Spirit work. Because the Holy Spirit is all about continuing the work of Jesus. Pastor Tanya, who can't be with us in person this morning, she works with young mothers at Step by Step. And this is Jesus' ministry happening today. Because Jesus consistently reached out to women. And so if it looks like Jesus, then it is Holy Spirit power. Common good is loving on children and families. Empowering young people to lead in the transformation of their communities. This is Jesus' work continuing today. Jesus reached out to families. He called young disciples. He equipped and empowered them to do His work. Looks like Jesus? Well, it's Holy Spirit power. Neighbors Immigration Clinic, you heard from Jesus last week is coming alongside our immigrant neighbors, providing legal services, support, advocacy. Jesus consistently reached across boundaries, welcomed the stranger, advocated for the oppressed. It looks like Jesus, it's Holy Spirit power. We could go on and on and on. If you want to know where the Spirit's working, look for places where people are doing work that looks like Jesus and join up with them. The Holy Spirit has a mission to empower Christians to continue the work of Jesus in this world. It's about God's plan, not our plan. You know, the Holy Spirit is described as wind in many places throughout the Bible. And I love this image of wind because the wind blows where the wind wishes, right? We we can't control where the wind's going to blow as much as we try. However, though, we can tap into the wind's power, can't we? And we can get in line 
with where the wind's blowing, and pretty miraculous and powerful things can happen. But we often treat the Christian life kind of like we're in a rowboat, and we're trying really hard to steer the boat in the direction we want it to go with all our power, with all our might. But how often does that just result in failure? Going against the wind. Instead, the Christian life, I think, ought to look more like a sailboat where the wind is blowing and we can get moving, but we got to tap into the wind's power. And once we do, it's not about us. It's about the wind that is moving us. You know, to be honest, I think one of the main reasons we fail to experience the Spirit's power in our lives is because we're not willing to move. (laughs) We want everything to stay the same. We don't want to take risks. We don't want to make changes. We don't want our churches to change. We don't want to listen to the Spirit. As Pope Francis said, the Holy Spirit bothers us because the Spirit asks us to move. And so if we want the Spirit's power in our lives, which I do, then, you know, I used to think if I want the Spirit's power, my sole purpose was just to pray really hard for it. And I think that's part of it. Prayer is part of it. But I think we also need to be willing to follow where the Spirit leads. We need to open our eyes and not just close our eyes asking for the Spirit to bless us and whatever we want. But we need to open our eyes and look around and see where the wind is blowing. Where are we seeing Jesus' work happening? And how can we join up with what God is doing already all around us? And if we want the Spirit's power, the Spirit may ask us to do things we don't want to do. The Spirit may lead you down a downward path. We don't talk about that too much, you know, and, uh, and even in, in denominations and Christian churches, it's like, as a pastor, it's like, you say, well, if you're here, then if you move to this church, you've got to go up in salary to this place, you know, and we can't ever make you go down, you know, and this is the way America, this is the way we think, right? The Spirit may call you to go on a downward path. Shane Claiborne once said that, you know, be careful when you're climbing the ladder of success because you might pass Jesus on his way down, <laughs> And and you got to be careful because, you know, you might fall off. Uh, And so you need to watch out because the Spirit may call you to a downward path. The Spirit may lead you to change something about your life. The Spirit may lead you to take your faith out into the public, as we talked about last week. The Spirit could lead you even to a city council meeting or to a protest or who knows. The Spirit may lead you to do something that the world may see as radical. You know, I think perhaps we've been asking the wrong kinds of questions. Maybe you've been asking, how can the Holy Spirit help me in my life? Or how can the Spirit help me reach my goals? And instead, I want to offer some questions that may be a bit more helpful. How can the Holy Spirit help me live more like Jesus? Might be a good question to ask. Where do I see people doing gospel work? When I say gospel work, work that looks like Jesus. Not just because people talk about Jesus. A lot of people talk about Jesus, but work that actually looks like Jesus. Where do I see the ministry of Jesus happening today, and how can I join up with what they're doing? I've given you some wonderful examples this morning of ministries and groups that are doing amazing work. Where is the Holy Spirit moving me? What about my life and my plans look different than Jesus' life and Jesus' plans, and how can the Holy Spirit help change that? These are some questions that you could wrestle with. How do we experience the power of the Spirit? Well, I was thinking about that song by Bob Dylan, that maybe he was on to something. That the answer, my friend, is blowing in the wind. (laughs) The answer is blowing in the wind. That the Spirit is moving. We need to pay attention to where the Spirit's moving. Two years ago, um, you know, the video of what happened to George Floyd, his tragic murder, came out shortly before Pentecost Sunday when we were talking about the Holy Spirit. On my computer, I have my original Pentecost sermon, and then I have the alternate version, which we actually, uh, I preached that Sunday morning. And one thing that that I just really felt God leading me um, and speaking to me um, on that weekend was that, you know, if we want Holy Spirit power, we've got to see where the Spirit's moving. And one of the things that we've got to do, particularly as a church that's predominantly white, (laughs) is we've got to join up with our black and brown brothers and sisters who are working for freedom, and, and liberation, and working for equity, and, and the Spirit's moving in those communities in radical ways, and we're often not seeing it, <laughs> because we're not willing to join up with what they're doing and following their lead, and I've really felt that strongly in that moment, and I've continued to be thinking about this and trying to incorporate things more into my life so that I can join up where the wind is blowing already, where the Spirit is moving, 
And I promise you that if you do that, you're going to experience more Holy Spirit power in your life because the Spirit is mission-focused. And the Holy Spirit's mission is to continue the work of Jesus. And so are you willing to get in line and follow where the Spirit leads? In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen.